you know, I still feel like the problem with seeking uh, diversity in areas of power or in spaces is that there's actually a culture that goes along. So it's not just like, you know, you bring in your separate experience. We often see that when people move beyond, um, move outside of where they were before and they move into a different culture, they assimilate. Mm -hmm. So just having a different colored face be in the hiring board, or, or, or a part of the ownership is not going to change the organization. You actually have to necessarily change the organization. And when you do that, you will get other people to be in there mm -hmm. because the nature of the organization has now been changed and they will matriculate other people up there. Mm -hmm. But just getting people up there without actually changing the culture of the organization doesn't really achieve what you really wanted to achieve. And, mm -hmm. and what I will say is the, the inequitable situation will not be changed by just adding a more diverse state, a more diverse set of the oppressors. The oppression will not change. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you make that a primary target of your reform, instead of an ancillary benefit that can be gained with a greater reform, then you, you end up with a situation where you'll be fighting for years just to get the diversity. And then even if you do get it, your situation remains unchanged. Okay. I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you, but I also think that it's, again, like I said, it's both and, right? So I agree, certain people do change when they get into particular situations and they're there for themselves and they're not going to be there to address the issues on race or even the issues on class, let alone class, right? Um, but, you know, while my homegirl April is taking up the diversity charge, I'm over here taking up the class charge. We do both and. There's no need for us to put one above the other because we're never going to get everyone rallied and behind one, right? And I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot from the black left. It's like, you know, if we, if we, you know, we're losing focus, right? We can't, we can't come together in unity and fight for one thing. No, we can't. We won't. We won't ever. So while they're bringing up the flank on race, we could bring up the left flank on class and hit them from both sides and get something changed out here. And, and see, what I would argue is that it's likely that as long as you're divided and the goal is unclear, you probably won't win on either front. Well, we're always going to be divided. Or if you do win on the diversity front. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I'll stand correct. What I meant to say was if you did win on the diversity front, you have to have the understanding that that wasn't really the main battle. That was the side mm -hmm. that if you want to improve the actual tangible situation. Yep. You have to win the greater fight. Yep. And that's why I like Jesse's speech. That's speech. All I like this speech because he actually addressed on a soft target, right? In a soft way, not a very direct way, but he addressed class just enough to keep the ball. He didn't do any, say anything detrimental to a class based argument. Um, but, you know, as diversity is being addressed by all the other people who are doing, dealing with diversity, people like you people like me and people like the progressive army, we will bring up uh, the left flank and make sure that nobody forgets about class. All right, folks, my kids are here with me. Let me, let me make one. Let me, Man, I'm about to say good night. Go ahead and get the last word. Nick. Okay. I was going to say, let me make one last one. Uh huh. The last thing I want to say is always remember that like when you're dealing with class consciousness, mm -hmm. we as a people, when I'm talking about black people in particular, a lot of us have really lost the class consciousness. We oh, yeah. root our, our economic, I mean, I'm sorry, our, uh, our politics and a cultural identity yep. instead of a political economy. And I think, you know, moving forward, we have to start reevaluating that. Not just reevaluating, but reminding people that all of our rich legacy, every bit of radical, um, every radical movement in the past, all of them converged eventually, not initially, but they all converged eventually around class and the need for a redistribution of wealth to fix a broken system that continues white supremacy. They realized in the 60s that we may have fixed civil rights um, or we may have made the civil rights situation better, but now we have this huge problem, right? So I agree with you. Uh, as, they, as they work on diversity, we'll always be there to remind them. We just need to bring the black left and the black flank, the left flank, we just need to bring it out bolder, stronger, um, and talk about uh, redistribution of wealth. Use the same language that Dr. King used. Use the same language that James Baldwin, well, not James Baldwin, but um, um, 
uh, that Ralph Abernathy used. Use the same language that uh, a, a. Philip Randolph. That's what I was trying to say. A. Philip Randolph used, particularly as it uh, pertains to a class-based argument and uh, economic bill of rights. You know, we have a rich history as African Americans in terms of socialism, and you know what? It's finally a year where we can say that and start reminding us. And you know what? All we need as we as black people do that and people like you, Nick, and people like me, as we do that, we we need our white comrades to be able to affirmatively say that there is a race problem in America, a problem of white supremacy, a problem of, uh, that we need to address. We need to address white privilege. And if we don't get rid of white privilege, we need to establish and create some black privilege. And we need to do that. Maybe we need to do that by re reparations, a, a race specific economic solution. We need white people to start, not just white people, not white neoliberals, because they've mastered that language and won't ever do a damn thing about it. We need white progressives who have their eye on the ball of a class-based remedy to be able to espouse racially specific solutions and language so that we don't get swift boated again, so that we don't get neoliberals out there talking about race and, 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 and being the Pied Piper bringing in the black democratic establishment. You know, we need white folks to be you know, able to end, do this. But I got Nick, I got to get you going. My wife is you out know, there with the kids. We'll pick this up okay, next time. Okay. Folks, you have a good night. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog, join the Progressive Army, and support The Benjamin Dixon Show. <laughs> if you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Y'all want to see my kids? <laughs> Let's see if they're asleep. Consider becoming a Patreon. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. Hold tight, YouTube. You don't want to be on, Benjamin? Say it's the Benjamin Dixon show. It's the Benjamin Dixon <laughs> Say hey everybody. Hey everybody. You, what do you like? Tell them what you like. You like Hello Kitty? Hello Kitty. How old are you? Uh, I don't know. You know, girl, you know how old you are. How old are you? Are you two? Two. You are not two. How old are you? One? One. How old are you, Lizzie? Um, three. Three. Okay. All right, give him a kiss. Mwah. Tell Benjamin, come here. Benjamin. All right, no Mario. <laughs> All right, he doesn't want to do it. I'm not going to make him. You guys have a good night.